Pat's Pizza and Bistro, 1426 West Broad Street, Bethlehem, PA. One of my favorite places to go in the Valley, and they came on as a sponsor. Yanni's been on the podcast before. He's had me up there from tastings. I've had everything from the chicken fingers, which are made from scratch, all the way up, all the way up to the brand new pasta flights. The pasta flights are trending. They are flying off the shelves. It's insane that they can even keep up. I met the chef over there. Legit, no joke stuff going on. They use clean ingredients, real food, fresh food. It is family owned, family operated. It is very fast and furious. If you go to their online website, it is right here. Um, you can get all this information. You can order there. You can place uh, pickup orders. You can have uh, delivery on certain days. And the hours of operation are on there as well. Please go check them out. I am not just saying this. They are a legit force to be reckoned with in the Valley. That's Pat's Pizza and Bistro, 1426 West Broad Street, Bethlehem, PA. Luke Delmeyer. Luke Delmeyer Knives. Handcrafted handmade knives. I use mine. I use mine every time we go to the pop-ups and it is ridiculous. It is just something special. There's something different. It's handcrafted. It's handmade. Um, Luke has grown since we started the show to now where he is pumping out knives and classes. I want to push his classes. If you go to LukeDelmeyer.com, it has all the information for the classes and you get to take a two-day course and you go over everything from safety on how to use it. Um, you're selecting the knife handles out and you're really from top to bottom getting to go through the whole experience. Where else can you find that in the Valley? Uh, Luke is a very special person to the show. He's really cool. We've done projects together. We um, we have uh, apparel we're doing together. Um, I really want you to go check it out. If you're interested in hand anything, handcrafted stuff, working class stuff, blue collar stuff, like this is the the area you need to go to. But it's Luke Delmeyer. Dot com Luke Delmeyer handcrafted knives. Um, sign up for those classes, those courses. Go check that out. It's really cool. It's a two day event, and um, you get the experience making your own knife, and then you take your knife home with you. Uh, and you're gonna take home a little bit more than that. So uh, check out Luke Delmeyer, friend of the show. Um, always awesome watching him grow. Luke Delmeyer.com. MindleafCBD.com. Mindleaf. Easton Zone, Mind Leaf CBD. Um, I didn't know a lot about CBD till they became a sponsor and they started coming on the show a lot. And Liz is huge for, uh, I learn something every time she comes on. They are over in College Hill in Easton. Um, you can check out all their information on mindleafcbd.com. I believe you can order there, but uh, go experience the store. Liz's mom works over there. Liz keeps bringing in products such as the Honey Flights. They have peanut butter, the infused pretzels. My favorite thing is the the, the tinctures to go to sleep. Uh, I have problems sleeping, um, and these things put me out, and I have a little bit of lucid dreams riding a unicorn, and then I wake up back to normal, and then I, I get excited to... Uh, to do that again. So um, my big thing I use with them is uh, the, the tinctures and um, the balm. The balm is another one. I use it for uh, aches and pains on my knees and my old man uses it for his arthritis. Uh, Mind Leaf CBD. Um, they are over in Easton on College Hill. Please go check the store out. Uh, really cool space. And um, like I said, Liz's mom's over there and they will help you with everything. It's awesome that they're super local and uh, I stand behind their CBD and everything that they got coming out of there. That's MindLeaf CBD, MindLeafCBD.com. Eric K. Dowdle, defense attorney. We had him on the show and what crazy stories this guy's had. He's helped a ton of people over the years. And uh, if you're looking for help, he is your guy. You can contact them at 610-882-3000 and it's ekdefense.com. Uh, do you have a pending court case? Do you have a court appearance and need a defense lawyer? Do you need proper representation? Felony misdemeanor, drug offense, assault, homicide, DUI, traffic violation, appeals, reach out to Eric. Check out the podcast we did with him as well. It has his whole whole story on there. If you need help, Eric is here to help you. He sponsors the show. We appreciate it. He's going to be doing a monthly thing with us. Eric will be a part of the family now. Thank you for sponsoring. Radio. No clue what episode this is. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Never Again Radio. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Um, thank you for driving here. Uh, I always appreciate it so much when anyone drives, uh, let alone dealing with Philly traffic. Um, so I really appreciate you coming out here and making the effort. It means a lot. Thank um, you for having me. Of course. <laughs> um, 
I believe from the tidbits I've saw on your social media and your stories, you used to live in the area and mm-hmm. then you moved. Um, you are a professional wedding photographer. Mm-hmm. And um, how did you get into photography? Where did your story start with art or where did the journey and path begin to get to where you get to do what you love for a living? So 2007, I graduated from Lehigh Valley College. I was doing graphic design, visual communications. And one of my friends was a wedding photographer and she needed a website. Um, And she, I traded a website for a camera. She gave me her old camera. And then another friend of mine was also a wedding photographer. She was super successful and she made it look really fun. And she was like, hey, if you want, come, you know, even just for half the day and second shoot with me and have fun. And so I did and I liked it. I thought this is fun. And then I still did graphic design. I was working another job too, full time. I was working at Rodale. Um, Were you already dabbling in photography at that point? No, not really. My dad was a wedding photographer, but I never, no. Yeah. And so after working with my one friend on the website and getting the real gear and then working with the other friend, I was like, hmm, maybe I could do this. And then I slowly started building a portfolio, like just doing free shoots for people. I put something back in the day of MySpace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my face. <laughs> and my girlfriend, who was a wedding photographer, would make slideshows all the time, which seemed super fancy back then, with music of yeah. people's weddings. And I thought, wow, that looks so cool. And then I started to put things out there on MySpace, like I'm going to do like a model call. Like, let's just do That's a shoot. crazy that you were doing that on MySpace, because primarily... I don't think anyone understood at that point what social media was or what that connection was, but for you to have done that that early on is pretty smart <laughs> to have start built. You know, my, my MySpace was so stupid and ridiculous. It really was. Um, but um, the top eight, and then yeah, you yeah, design yeah, yeah, the yeah. background, yeah. Like, and then the people that would like uh, have like the glitter bombs where your computer would just freeze and shut yes. down. Um, oh my gosh! Then they would then they started adding music with that, and then that's when I think a lot of people bounced on it. And then Facebook was like not popular yet yeah 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 because it's so funny going back to that because myspace is kind of it was facebook but no one understood that there was the connection on everything so for you to be doing that and trying to pull business off that you were kind of ahead of the curve i was obsessed with blogs too i was so always, i never got into blogs i was always reading blogs like i was working at men's health magazine as an international production coordinator how'd you get into that um I went to a 5.45 a.m. spin class in Allentown at LA Fitness, and want my my instructor at the time, my spin instructor, she made an announcement in spin class. She was like, I'm looking for an assistant. And I was, and after class, I went up to her, and she was like, oh, awesome, Denise. Like, I would love to have you. And then, yeah, and actually HR, like, really didn't want to hire me but she like was like no I want this girl like she's gonna be working directly with me like that's who I want and I handled all the artwork and saw all the photography of all the celebrity shoots and it was a really fun Emmaus you know Rodale and Emmaus they I think they sold the company now they still just have like the farm and the institute or whatever but I loved working there and um the pay was really tough though it was like I hit the ceiling I was like you know I'm not like this is like this isn't sustainable financially it usually happens in the jobs that you like is that it doesn't financially pay especially in like um just a world like that where you're brought on to be an assistant and do all that fun stuff where it doesn't seem like it's work because you love it or you enjoy it but then you can't live off of it yeah and the lifestyle aspect of it was really the the perk of working there because like they had like the organic cafe and all that and and then like yeah. you could go work out for like an like an hour and a half at lunchtime two hours and nobody cared like it was encouraged like use the gym yeah use the bikes go do this like it was like healthy so i'm like really thankful but that was always around good photography i think just it kind of like was like I just was always looking at photography. That's what my job was. Did you handle. look at photography that way with growing up because your father was a photographer? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, because he always had photos all over the house all the time. Going down the hallway, he had like all these like, he would, 
he was like doing a night photography project, all black and white photography and playing. And he loved Ansel Adams and like the zone system, zone metering or something. I don't know. He was always trying to teach me, but I didn't really get into it until like 2007. And I became like aware that you could really make a good living doing it. And I thought, hmm, I could do this. And then after I started doing the things on social media and started working and doing fun shoots for fun and for little money, little to no money, it started to give me a portfolio. And then I started second shooting for people and then just doing like family and friends weddings. My first wedding, I got paid $200. Yeah, I try and work with, um, like there's definitely photographers I've worked with to get stuff done, but then I also like to uh, involve people who are at that level where they're trying it out. And then, yeah. like, cause there's girls or anyone will come down and then they'll be like, Hey, like, you know, can I just come down and shoot? And I'm yeah. like, I don't, you're giving me content. I don't care. Try it out. You know, most of the time I'm doing it with my phone. So if you want to learn photography, and I've worked with some really cool people and we used to do, um, fashion shoots for the clothing oh, cool. and I would find locations and um, I would get a bunch of different models and girls and guys and then the photographer always thought it was cool because they were learning to do something on a bigger level so I always enjoyed working with people that were chasing after photography and yeah. then seeing them continue it is really cool yeah yep um, oh and then art art has always been like a part of me like I've always been into art like fine art I went to school first for fine art at the Barnstone Studios it was like a small private school Myron Barnstone ran it he it was in Copley um I had a studio space there and then um I went to school later in life for graphic design like when that came on the scene and that's when I graduated in 2007 and photography just kind of made sense yeah yeah because graphic design was harder to find work in like and even the jobs I was finding it was like such little pay (laughs) you know what I mean like you can't live on that like can't so when I started to get into weddings I noticed that like I really had like a knack for it like dealing with people I love people like dealing with brides who are nervous like I felt like I can keep them calm I can work with this I love fashion and beauty and my thing is like love light and beauty and I feel like weddings like encapsulates that yeah um and I always try to like find the beauty element of it and interesting light and stuff like that and I think that's why I don't know it just took off like yeah it seems to be like just from the little I heard is you know you have your art and then you have your different things that you're kind of working on and there's aspects of them that are in wedding photography like you know how you were you know doing the magazine stuff and Mm -hmm. then the stuff you were dealing with that directs directly to yes that so it's like you finding that lane it must have felt kind of relieving because you were able to do these things but then they didn't Yes. You weren't able to live off of them. Which if is it, if you are in love with a passion and you get to do that and get yes. paid, you, it's freeing. Yes. And like editorial, I love. So working in magazines, I think, gave me such an editorial eye. Because uh, like some people say I have a very editorial style in the way I you shoot. You worked on the back end, so then you know what picture need, you know what picture you already want because you know how it's going to look in the magazine. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, and blogging was really important to me back then. And blogging is kind of also kind of how... Did you blog or were you just into blogs? I did blog, yeah. yeah. I, like, that's kind of how I think my, my SEO, like, because I used blogging to up the ante with my SEO because you, you use, you know, in WordPress, or whatever, you have, like, the tagging yeah. section. And I would constantly tag myself fine art wedding photographer or Bethlehem wedding photographer or Philadelphia wedding photographer New Jersey wedding photographer or family photographer whatever I was blogging I would put all those key and there was a point when I was regularly blogging that I was like coming up on the first page and like I've gotten out of blogging because I don't really read blogs as much anymore I don't know blogging is kind of I don't know I want to get back to would it would you switch to vlogging so then you could do video yes let's do because you already have I'm the gonna equipment do vlogging. yeah 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 yeah. Well, it would make sense. I mean, I feel like, you know, blogging as to vlogging is 
the same as reading a book to an audio book. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like where audio books are kind of like, they're here, they're definitely, I don't think they're taking over, but there's definitely a large portion of people Absolutely. that can, you know, you're exercising, you can listen to them. Absolutely. Like reels and yeah. stuff, like everything's yeah. moving more in that video yeah. direction. Yeah. Like doing reels and... Boy, that's an adjustment. Ugh, trying to. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm trying to get better at reels. I'm trying yeah. to like, you know, you have to keep up with technology. It's tough. Yeah. It's, and well, and then it's hard to explain because some of my friends will give me shit about being on my phone. But like, if you're running a business, you have to feed the algorithm. Yes. It's like a hungry animal that if you don't feed it, you get left behind. Yep. So it's like feeding that algorithm. I had a leg up because I was editing podcast so then now the basic editing for reels is very similar to like basic editing that i was learning so like that's cool for me i was able to transition into it but you still got to make it look good you still got to add music and then you still got to deal with why was it this many numbers yesterday and it's quadrupled today and there's no rhyme and reason uh social media you have to like really just <laughs> accept it for what it is they um, do, it's hard they do say that when you do a reel you want to like the way they get more views and get favored is to post something that people want to watch over and over again. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So that it, it either it's informational and they need to watch it a couple times to get it, or it's something that catches you right away. And, and that's like, the tricky part. And there's tricks to like, you know, what's crazy is it just keeps getting shorter, 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 shorter. So like in the beginning it was a minute, which is opposite of how Instagram used to be. Cause Instagram used to only be like 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Then they gave you a minute where now it's like, we started with the minute and now people are like, you know, you'll see a reel where it's five seconds and it's a moment and then they time the music and then there's like doing tricks where like someone wants to watch it again because it wasn't enough time to comprehend. Yes, that's what I'm like, saying. Like there's all kinds yeah, of like. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Those are the ones I think that You get start deep favored. diving yeah. reels. Yeah. Uh, it gets crazy, but they want TikTok. So they're pushing it. They want to pay people. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even the stuff that I saw that you're doing, um, you know, you can transition into that. And you can, you know, now you can start selling people a wedding by them having a glance at the window looking into your reels. Yeah. So you almost yeah. have to do it. You have to. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. But I enjoy creativity in all forms. I think weddings are really cool because they really do encompass everything that I love to shoot. Um, they can be stressful, obviously. It's like such a high pressure, high stress day, but I think working with families and brides and it's like the best day of people's lives and you know just coming and showing up with a good attitude and a good spirit well i was gonna say you really can't show up in a bad mood because no. it's somebody's wedding yeah and i talk to them a lot yeah. before the wedding but um to like befriend them and because i'm spending such a i'm with them when they're putting their dress on yeah you know and behind the scenes like they're getting ready in front of me and they're talking to me all day and i'm with their family and their mom and their dad and sometimes they have a family member that has passed away a lot of like we've had a lot of situations where you know you have to be really sensitive like yeah because you know like one time i remember the my second shooter was like oh, i felt so bad because the groom needed a minute because his father had passed away not that long before the wedding and so you just have to have this level of sensitivity but yet be creative i like the challenging i like all of it um but yeah it's probably um i'm all over the place <laughs> very like um like captures you because there's so much things you need to do plus you're hanging out behind the scenes plus you're trying to shoot it the way you wanted it and you guys are coordinating on one level and then you're meeting all these people in and out you have to be exhausted when that's over by the end of the day yes you have it you've given it everything you have and then sometimes and especially after covid i had a couple of weekends where i had three and four weddings in a row so you're oh yeah i forgot there yeah. was no weddings <laughs> yeah like so you're like coming home super late at night yeah uploading all the images backing them up going to bed late because you're waiting for everything to get off your cards onto the drives and back that up. I forgot about the entire back end of that. Yeah. And then in the morning, you get up and do it all over again and you have to do it three days in a row. And then now we're an instant, everything's instant. People want to see something yesterday. Yeah. Like, you know, they want to see a sneak peek right away. So you do sneak peeks and yeah. And then emails and new clients. I mean, it's a lot. Running a business is a lot. But I'm really, really grateful. Really well, let's hang in the business part of it. Where did um, 
When did the business start shaping up? I know early on, just out of my personal experience, and it may not be the same with you, but you were saying you get two hundred dollars. Where did you find your worth? Where did where did you know where to start pricing yourself correctly? So, the Lehigh Valley was harder for me to break in to the wedding industry. I wasn't shooting as many weddings when I lived in Lehigh Valley, and I was working, um, you know, at Rodale and. Um, you know, just doing very, very minimal weddings. Cause you know, there's all the market here. It was more competitive and the big dogs are the big dogs here, you know? So I started to find photographers in, near Philly, the Philly area. And, um, there was one photographer who I really loved her work. I really admired her. And I started to, I reached out to her and I was like, can we get coffee? You know, I would love, I love your work. I feel like a kindredness with your work. I feel, you know, I'm not shooting those types of weddings yet, but I know I have that, that style and that eye. I can feel it. And she looked at my work and she agreed. She was like, absolutely. Like I can see you're not shooting at the same venues I am or, you know, with the same clientele, with the same, um, you know, like there's a difference between shooting a wedding at a fire hall, right? Yeah. Then like in Philly at the downtown club, you know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. like there, there's a big difference. So you gradually start to um, work with bigger and like higher end wedding photographers as like an assistant or second shooter. And then I started seeing, you know, how that market worked. And as I started to second shoot, that started to elevate my personal portfolio. Now, when I advertised on The Knot and The Wedding Wire, now the work I showed was elevated than fire halls in the Lehigh Valley, right? Yeah. Not that I shot at a fire hall, but I'm exaggerating. No. You know what I mean? Um, like Hotel Bethlehem is probably the nicest venue in in Bethlehem that I loved. I still shoot there. And so, but you can't just show one venue. You know what I mean? You have to show everything. So when I started showing Philadelphia weddings, I started getting more inquiries now from more like venues that I really was excited to shoot at with vendors I really wanted to work with. Like in the wedding community, there are planners, there are florists, there are hair and makeup people, there are stylists, there are just people that you aspire to work with before you get to that level. You know, it's kind of like, it, it makes your work, we're a team. It's not just my photography because a bride is looking at your portfolio and she wants to see herself in there, either herself or something she aspires to. You know what I'm saying? So like I aspire to work better weddings. So I became like an assistant or an associate. And then that showed me, okay, now I can raise my prices because now my work is elevated. The clientele will pay that rate now. Yeah, I was just last night looking at, I have like a, a file of like this many contracts, like from all the weddings since like 2017. And I was looking at those contracts and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe how low I charged. Yeah. And, <clears throat> but gradually you gain the confidence. It's tough to do that. And then people start to tell you, wait, wait, you're way too low. Like you're selling yourself short. Plus you're making me look bad because you're on my level. Like, I'm losing business to you. Or I wouldn't book a job because they thought something was wrong with me because my prices were too low. So now it's crazy. And people still say I need to raise my prices, but it's kind of like you feel yourself out in the market and then you know like you're, you start to learn who your competitors are. And in the Philadelphia community, it's awesome. Philly has the best photography community. We are like, I just met with, seven or eight of my favorite photographers in Philly who I was invited to meet at my one friend's studio and we talked pricing and we support each other. We're competitive. We're friendly competitors. Like there's so much business to go around and I feel like it's, it, you work with the people you're meant to work with. Like the people that vibe with you. Like somebody that vibes with me may not vibe with my competitor and vice versa. You know what I mean? And that's why it's so important branding and putting yourself out there and showing your personality and and social media. I think that is, you know, key. But 
yeah, it all works together. I'm um, all over the place. That is a very, you're fine. Um, yeah. That is a very unique thing that mm-hmm. um, I don't know if every area has that where you get together and meet and be like, all right, well, let's put all of our prices the same because they're not going to hot, you know, like what you were saying is if somebody <clears throat> is likes the conversation on the phone with you better, they're taking you over that, not just your portfolio. Exactly. So you have to sell yourself once you get there. Mm-hmm. And if everybody's pricing is the same, it takes out all the bullshit of, hey, that was too little. This is too high. Mm-hmm. And then you guys can all just make money and not step on each other's toes because they're hiring for you, mm-hmm. not the actual and you're not price gouging yeah. but you're also not sell- selling yourself short you're also not undercutting your friend yeah because it's a really cool way i wish more people did business like that i think it's probably a lot of the problems that goes on in the valley and then or anywhere and then you just have arguing and then people making up scenarios and next thing you know you're in a war with somebody who doesn't even know who you are mm-hmm. so like that takes out so much yeah. uh so much drama and headache and during covid we were there for each other um, one of the photographers, um, that like helped me so much, like with figuring out the PPA loan, um, or PPP loan. What was it? PPP. Not PPA. Yeah. I don't, I don't know which one it was, but I know it was the PPP, about. whatever. Yeah. 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 And like grants and things that were available cause we were making no money in 2020 yeah. and it was really scary. And I do know that there are a lot of photographers who completely pivoted out of weddings altogether. And I'm really grateful. I'm still standing, not only still standing, but came out stronger. Yeah. Yeah. It was a weird time. I mean, I didn't get anything and I had to adjust things with this business. And um, if you paid attention to it, you could have actually like stopped and tweaked a lot of things and made your business tighter, which is what I chose to do. Yeah. And then um, now, you know, in the beginnings of businesses, and I'm sure it was that, and especially moving to Philly, and like, you know, we were talking the cost of living is totally different. So high. (laughs) Instead of being around here or anywhere else. So it's like, when you're early on in that and you don't know your worth and you're trying to get the money in and everything and then like you, your confidence is like man I don't know but you're still but you took the leap so like you can't you can but like for me it wasn't an option so like you're going through all of this and then in the end of it it's like you have to come out with confidence mm-hmm. and I thought I think a lot of like what went on during the pandemic that I think a lot of people don't even really talk about is when you had that time to yourself and it was weird and scary and people weren't driving getting through that I was just like oh like I remember one point being like oh all right like that was really tough to get through but I did and then I had this relief of like well that scenario wasn't ever even supposed to be real right so like I got through it so like how I feel now is I feel like my failure rate doesn't exist because I would have failed already and it would have been at that point. Same. I feel it's really crazy. I am so grateful for that experience. Yeah. Cause it it's almost like I came to the end of my rope. Yeah. During that. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I'm gonna sink or swim here. And it feels amazing that like, you know, to come out on top like that, to feel like I'm more successful now. I learned so much more. I know what I'm capable of. Yeah. And also I bonded with a lot of my clients who had to reschedule. I just spoke with one of my previous brides today um, and she was saying you know, she's pregnant now and um, I'm not gonna say who cause she wants it to be a secret and surprise or whatever, but not that like whatever, like that you know her. Yeah. But she was saying like, we, like I, I just really like love you. Like I bonded, like we bonded through COVID and everything. And now that I'm having my baby, like I want you to be there. Like maybe I could hire somebody that just specializes in babies and families and maternity. But because I have that comfort level with you and you were there with me through COVID and they did a small like rooftop, rooftop elopement too that I was a part of and we were wearing masks and we were being careful and scared and everything and you know you bond through that and then they trust you and yeah it's gotta be crazy for the people that had weddings small and we're supposed to be married and then when all that stopped and you have money Mm -hmm. already out on all this stuff and then Mm -hmm. you don't even know what the venues are gonna do that must have been a wild time to deal with clients like that it really was and I tried to yeah, I feel like I made so many more friends actually with my clients and yeah. and a lot of my couples after the wedding, they still 
like use me for their few as their family grows and i think that's another cool aspect of what i do is like just developing the relationships with people because i don't have a very big family um i never knew my mom and i don't have sisters or anything and i'm not remarried i'm divorced so um i live alone um and I share custody with my son. He's in another state, actually, which is a whole nother story. But so my families that I photograph, they really, I really treat them like they're the family I never had. Yeah. And I see so much love, like family, familial love, like fathers with their daughters or mothers and daughters or mothers and sons. And I'm just, it it just touches me in a way because it's like, oh, it does exist. You know, not that I don't, I have an amazing dad. Like he raised me alone and he's amazing. Um, But I don't have like a normal traditional family, like some of these things I see when I shoot weddings. And so that emotion and all of that, I'm more like, I'm really in tune to it. I'm really sensitive to it. I really like to witness it and be a part of it because I never really had that like, perfect picket fence family you know what i'm saying yeah but i'm sure it takes um somebody like yourself to take the things that you love and surround you with it and then take the things that um you you know you've developed a way to to put yourself around things that you love whether it's creativity and then to hear that part of the story it would only make sense that it would show through your work because now you're almost you know you when when you allow yourself to be open to give a day like that with mm-hmm. clients, it's mm-hmm. very similar to what I do here, and I didn't realize I was doing it until I started doing it. So when you open yourself to that, to take in everything, I mean, it understands why you're doing this and why you're gonna be at a level that you want to is because every part of it that you take in is in a loving manner because now mm-hmm. you can witness you know, all this stuff that you missed out on, but then you also get their love from you capturing those moments. Yes. It's very unique. It is. And almost like you were on a path to begin with mm-hmm. to find this. Mm-hmm. But when I have people down here and we showcase who they are and you, you know, it, I always tell everybody when you get on a path and you just stay there because it's going like, that's gotta be crazy for you to be able to get so much out of one thing and then to be able to turn it into a job and then to be able to turn it into a living and then now you're just kind of freely creating and living in these moments that you either missed or you just wanna be a part of. Mm -hmm. What is any of that like? It's really cool because it's, it's like, it fills your heart, it gives, you know, the love that you put out comes back to you and I wanna surround myself with positive, loving, um, light filled energy like I believe in giving that and it comes back and when people get their photos back and they like they come back to me and they say Denise I, I'm crying like these photos are like what you captured was amazing and I'm feeling all the love and all the joy and everything from the day all over again it's just a really fu- it's fulfilling in, in a really neat way it's fulfilling it's like I don't know that I'm not, I'm not like saving lives, but I'm saving memories that one day when that person passed, like I always try to take pictures of people's grandparents. I always try to get like a single portrait of like the matriarch of the family. Like that is my goal. Like, because I know how important that, per- the whole family would not be there if it wasn't for that cute red haired grandma in the corner there that most people just don't even pay attention to. I try to find a moment to talk to her in the reception and hear her story. Or like sometimes I'm I'm seeing grandparents still alive, both of them, and they're married and they're married like 60 years because they're like 85. And you're like, 60 years? You've been married, six, wait, 60 years? How? Yeah. Like, what is that like? My parents just hit the 50th. That's insane. Yeah, it was weird. Well, this is also bringing it full circle is they brought their wedding album. Cool. So like, it was crazy to see one, it I saw my grandmother, who I haven't seen in forever because the only pictures you see now are of people that are alive. Right. And back then, you didn't take pictures like now. I know. And then I was like, holy shit. I'm like, 
nanny. And yeah. then I was like, then I saw my grandfather. And then I saw my dad, who was a spitting image of me and my brother. Right. And then the fashion back then is funny because like I'm in, like, you know, it was like a white suit, black. And then I see my uncle behind him. And then there's a picture of my dad and my uncle. And you can just tell they were trouble. And then it's like, <laughs> then I see my mom and I've never seen my mom like that. And I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm like, holy shit, how old were you guys? It's cool. And they're not far from my age. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, that's nuts. And doesn't it go fast? Like every, like life... Things that's go that's so what tripped fast. me out, and it's got to probably trip you out taking pictures of people like that all the time, and then hearing of somebody passing or just seeing an older generation. Because it's like I go home all the time to see my parents, so they lived eight minutes down the road. So I've watched them grow old, but like seeing my mom and dad at that age, I was like, holy shit! And then I try to put myself in their shoes because I'm in my 40s, so I believe like the 40s is the best mental space that you can have. Like you've lived long enough. Like mm-hmm. I'm really enjoying I like my 40s. 40s. Me too. Lot. I like <laughs> yeah. my 40s too. I've been waiting to be 40 for a while. Um, I haven't been waiting, but I like it. <laughs> well, I'm my, okay with in it. In like my late 30s, I, I just always kept hearing 40s, 40s, 40s. And then when I got here, it was like bam. And I was like, there's so much less nonsense I put up with in life. But um, I'm looking at my parents and I'm like, man, like. There's my mom and dad, no kids. There's a moment of picture in them, and I'm like, they're like, they're, like, we're about to start a family. Yeah. And I'm like, man, it's the amount of stuff that's held in a photo, I and know. then the amount of times that you're gonna get to go through that with some people. It's uh, it's a pretty incredible, it's a unique thing. Yeah, it's a legacy, yeah. and like your kids' kids see it. Yeah. Kids, 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 kids see it. Like sometimes at receptions, they have a table that is. Of both sides of the family, like their old wedding photos and their grandparents, their, their parents, their grandparents, and their great grandparents. Some of those photos, like you said, they're just so beautiful and cool. And I'm like, wow, one day maybe my photo will be on a table for someone's great grandparent. Like I'll be got dead and gone, but that photo will be in that person's family. And that's really cool about yeah. what I do. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I didn't realize. I mean, I was interested, and that's why I wanted to bring you on. And then I saw the level of content that you're doing, and I, I, I like the style that you're presenting. And Thank like, you. like as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, this is bougie. I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> um, but like, to me, to see a wedding like that, you know, um, I don't see that a lot. So then to Thank see you. that, it, and then like, you know, and then when you started going into like how you were shooting with magazines, what made sense? Because this is photography you would see in a magazine. Mm-hmm. So, um. It was pretty cool to uh, to walk through this. What was it like when you first got paid and knew that you were going to be able to support everything going on in your life? Because I know what it's like to be grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. Then you take the leap and you're still... You, when you take that leap, it's still not the correct time, but you need the time you have from the other thing you're doing mm-hmm. to do that full time. Yep. And then there's a really shitty five or six months where you're like, ah! Yes. So like when you first got paid and you're like, this is it, I am I can live off this, what was that like to, to take that stress off? So you know how we went through the recession yeah. in 2008? That is what made me pivot out of magazines because I saw publishing taking a hit during the recession. Everything took a hit. So I was like, oh my God, like I could lose my job. So a friend of mine um, was working at a bank and compliant was the, the chief compliance officer. And um, it was actually my friend's mom. And she was like, Again, somebody I knew was like, I would love to have you be my assistant. I could teach you everything. I could teach you compliance. Like I'll t- and she taught me. And I became like um, a compliance coordinator. And then when she left, she got a new job. They were actually looking to replace her. And um, I thought about maybe going for it. But then everybody I worked with was like, no, you're so talented at photography. You better go for that. Well, and the bank ended up selling. So I got a severance because I had been there for five years at that point when they sold. I was still building my business on the back while I was working at the bank. I'm so grateful that I was working at a bank because that being in compliance helped me to be better with contracts, to be better with filing, organization, to be a good business person, to know how to do QuickBooks, to handle spreadsheets, just all the things that as a creative person, I'm not naturally inclined to do. But being in a bank setting was like forced me into that. And I developed such good, healthy habits from that. But when I left, 
when the bank sold and I had the option to take a severance or go back to training to be uh, go further with compliance, like go to be like a junior level compliance officer. I decided to take the severance. I was also going through a divorce. So I was going through a divorce. I got laid off from my job, ended up moving in. Um, my son and I moved in with one of my coworkers. She had a beautiful townhouse and she was a widow. And so she was like never, she was either never home or she was in her room. She was like, you guys, we had two bedrooms. It was like 550 a month. It was so cheap. And I was like, I can afford 550 a month while I'm trying to build my business, living on my severance, going through a divorce. It was insane. My whole life felt like it was crumbling, but yet it was an opportunity to rebuild and do what I really love. And that's when I started working for that photographer in the Philly area. And I started going to her studio twice a week to edit. And then I became her, like one of her second shooters and one of her associates. And through that, um, I started to be able to book my own. And that's when I was charging real rates, you know, getting out of the Lehigh Valley. And now I'm not, now it's not just a side hustle. Now it's my full time job and I have to charge a real rate. And it felt amazing. It was like, oh my God, I'm out here in the deep end yeah. and I'm doing it. Like I'm doing this, this is working. And, um, you know, it just continued to grow and it feels, and I'm, I'm still, I still am so grateful some days when I am doing my QuickBooks or when I talk to my accountant or when I pay my taxes and I'm like, oh my God, I can do this. And I still have money left over to save and to be smart. And now, you know, thinking about retirement and I'm like, oh my God, retirement is not that far away. I mean, it is, but it's, you know, you have to really think about Because when you're in the corporate world, you, that's like kind of, it's you. set up for you. Yeah. Your taxes are taken yeah. out for you already. I just had the conversation with someone. You did? When they were like, where, you know, where do you, where do you want to stop? And where, where do you want it to end? And I was just like, I've never had this conversation. Because usually if you get a job, it's like, well, I'll stay here and then it's over. Where now it's like, oh, I should probably pay attention to that because it's not built into what I'm doing. Yeah, HR is not coming no. to get Denise Marie. For, there's no <laughs> HR department of Denise Marie Photography. It's Denise. Like, yeah. I'm HR. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's my boyfriend now. He's always telling me, you need to save for retirement. And, like, we're always talking about it. But, um, yeah, I feel like the it's the coolest feeling to be able to support yourself and support your, my, my son too, like on doing what you love, you know, and it takes a lot of courage to, um, you know, leave that nine to five and leave health insurance being set up in your IR, your, your IRA or whatever. It's tough. It, it is a tough. lot of it. Um, it's almost like set up to keep you there mm -hmm. because they don't want you to leave. <clears throat> so they offer things and then, um, you know, and I've worked a million different jobs and I have a friends who work a million different places and a lot of them, um, I don't, back in the day, I used to think what I was doing was crazy because of not having insurance and things like that. Yeah. And it's like, it did pay off for me and it, it, there was a risk and this could have not worked. Mm -hmm. But like, to me, it's to, to do what you love and to especially to get out of a situation that you were in, which was just like a lot going on, the single mom, all this stuff. And then to get up over that was probably so filling where you, the other things in life stop really mattering. And then you have this kind of freedom and this, this uh, like happiness that I can't describe because I've never had it, but then I just felt whole. Yeah. And when you feel that way, I feel that's how everyone should feel. And yeah. a lot of people don't go after that because yeah. they want insurance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So to me, it's like, you know, hey, you know, I'm sure you have friends who are like, I'm retiring in 10 years. And to me, it's like, well, in 10 years, you can't figure out what you want to do. And there's nothing against it. And there's some people that are totally could care less. And they go home from work and they cut it off and they and watch a movie or whatever. And then they do that every day. I was never the type to do that. I've always been looking for something. That's I, awesome. I remember That's back, awesome. I remember back in the day, not even knowing what I was looking for. You and know? look, and now you're empowering, you're empowering people because every guest that you speak to, there's an inspirational, of course, but message and, and that's that, that helps the world. And I feel like we're here for such a short time. God, we're here so short. Yeah. Looking at those wedding photos of my parents. I mean, yeah. that, that was 
to yeah. Them. So like, I don't want to wake up one day and be like, what the hell did I do with my life? Yeah. What did I do with my life? Nothing. I, I don't want to just live for me, you know, or stay stagnant. So I'll never retire. I mean, maybe my life, my jobs will, my, you know, maybe the type of weddings I do, or maybe I'll take more of an educational route or write a book. Or I don't know, but I never want to retire. Like I'm, I don't know. I think you always have a you always have to have a reason to get out of bed. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll get depressed. Other than coffee. Other than coffee. <laughs> oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, I, th- I think I love coffee. Yeah, it's, I was talking to somebody today. A friend of mine just got a new job and she moved to Delaware, so uh, it's been a minute. And then so now we're like back on a schedule where we can talk again because she's moved in and settled. And she's like, how's your morning going? And I'm like, I only woke up to drink coffee. <laughs> the only reason I woke up today was to drink coffee. And your coffee shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's coming. So I'm, ex- I, yeah. I'm excited to be able to have that style coffee. Like, I'm excited to be spoiled. Uh, coffee? Because it'll be the, it'll be the uh, payoff of putting up with the crazy. Is I'm spoiled There's something so comforting about coffee. Like yeah. having a cup of coffee. You know, like, and having a cup of coffee with someone, it just, it's the best. I love coffee. I'm going hiking tomorrow. A friend of mine just opened up a coffee shop, the the Coven uh, coffee shop in Delaware Water Gap. And I live, my parents live over here and it's really easy. The Appalachian Trail is very accessible from mm-hmm. here. Um, but I can actually hike and across the street from her coffee shop is a church and the bottom of the church is where you can stay if you're long term on the Appalachian Trail. Oh, cool. So it's like a, a spot, but you can get off there. So That's then I so put cool. two and two together where I was like, yo, I can, me and my buddy are going to start in Wing Gap and go all the way to the Delaware Water Gap and then have coffee because their coffee shop's open. So we're timing it to like get there, get off the mountain, take off our packs and just sit down and have coffee. And like, That's I'm perfect. I'm so pumped to do Sounds that. Sounds like heaven. Yeah. Cause it's like, I mean, hope there's coffee in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> the, like even on vacation, like I remember on vacation, that's when I fell in love with coffee was mm-hmm. getting up and we go down to the Outer Banks. So it'd be get up, watch the sunrise. And then I remember having that. And then ever since then, it's just chasing that cup of coffee and that's yeah. it. But I, I, I really, I really like having moments with coffee. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Where are you at now with everything? I mean, we kind of brushed over, you know, the the ins and outs of you building it up and then um we got to the point now where you are charging a regular rate and now you're bi- building a business and you're working with other teams of photography and you guys are having these meetings and like where do you want this business to go do you want to just keep growing the brand do you want to rebrand do you want to step off and do other things like what do you want this entire project to turn into now that you have it done i would really love to work with like high-end wedding planners um i would like to work with um celebrity clientele with athletes with um just like i want to shoot i I, like i love shooting beauty i love i love when i walk on site somewhere and it takes my breath away and i feel like a kid in a candy store and i'm like oh my god i get to shoot this oh my god oh my god where do i start like you get this feeling like like a fat kid eating cake. You know, like you're just like, oh my God. Um, and I feel like as a creative, you always want to keep pushing for like, I, I want to do more destination weddings. I want to, I've never shot a wedding in in Italy or Paris. I want to shoot What's the furthest there. place you went and shot? Hawaii. I did shoot a wedding oh, in Hawaii. Oh, that must have been a blast. Yes. And I've yeah. done shoots in Italy and I've done shoots in Paris, but they were more like styled shoots. How does that you know? work? The, 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 uh, obviously the wedding has to pay for your travel and all that. Yes. Yes. So I haven't marketed myself as a destination wedding photographer. I have yeah. not. And th- that's a whole nother animal. And this is where it comes back to reels and content where you can literally start just going to the venue, shooting them, uploading reels. And then when people start seeing your stuff, they're like, ah, she knows, she knows yes. how to, she knows how shoot. to shoot Hawaii. And that's the thing is like, so before COVID, I was the week that the shutdown of the world happened, I was supposed to go to Morocco. I was on my way to Morocco and then the trip got canceled. I was going to do 
um, there was a celebrity wedding photographer who was hosting a workshop in Morocco. And I was so excited because I, I knew it was going to be, I had gone to her other workshop that was in Burgundy, France. It was at the Chateau. It was. That's so fun to be able still, to do this with your career. It was still my favorite. It was like, the, it, it really is. It was like my most favorite mind-blowing experience ever when i pulled up to that chateau it was like i had arrived in heaven and everything we shot was just so beautiful the gowns the neem khan gowns i don't even know if i'm pronouncing it right it was like a fifteen thousand dollar gown and just you just this feeling you get of like you know photographing that so when i if i i was starting to think i think i'm gonna market myself more so i started to go like travel more but then COVID happened so it shut down my travel and I still haven't gotten back into traveling like I used to I used to go a lot the one year I was in Paris three times I just love Paris That's fun. love it I love Paris I love Italy I really want to go to Greece I have, I have not been to Greece yet I don't want to go to Santorini I don't know I have so many places I want to go but if you market yourself if you go to these places and you host shoots or you go to a shoot and you show that stuff regularly like you said and you tag share you know all of that on social media then it like pulls you in even just now if i shoot in philly um there's certain venues i shoot at like 10 times a year because of social media because i shared and if i share something on instagram from a venue that pulls in a lot of brides who are getting married at that venue because yeah. they look up their venue yep. on instagram and they find me that way and so I'm so grateful for social media. It's hard to break the code sometimes, and I'm still trying to learn too, but it's so helpful. Yeah, the, benef the benefits outweigh any of the... Yeah. I primarily hang on Instagram. That's my favorite thing to work yeah, on. I think, I think it's the fastest. Too. It dumps on other stuff. Yeah. Um, and I've just kind of been building my brand on Instagram, so yeah. there's no point in taking it anywhere else because it's not the same platform. But like, I really, the benefits and what I've been able to do with this business and the stuff that, I mean, back in the day, it was not throttled and was way easier to do stuff. It was, yeah. But you can also pay to go out further and things like that. So it's like, I wouldn't be, this wouldn't exist if I didn't have social media. So like, it definitely outweighs the nonsense that comes with it, but that's really cool the way, you know, it's always interesting to have people come on and then because I have to live in social media, then when you start getting other people's takes on like social media and what they can do, like you can really pick up a ton of business, I bet, just from the wedding stuff and mm -hmm. then sharing it and collaborating and pushing it through and then having a network. And then I never thought like, of the amount of women that probably sit on Instagram looking up wedding shit, whether they're even yeah. about to get married or, you know, that's such a big deal for girls. Like it they is. think about that since they're kids. They are. And then for all that to go through, it's a really cool avenue. And sometimes it's a dress designer. Sometimes they'll find you because you tagged a dress. Yeah. You 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 tagged and shared something that was a dress designer, and they love that dress designer, and they find you that way. Yeah. Um, but I would really like to take a more educational route one day with it. Um, being that I'm in my 40s now, and I've been doing this for a long time, there's a lot I can share. And and I have associates. I have an associate team. Um, I have eight people that I work with, but four of them are really really ready. They're the other six or excuse me i can't count the other four i'm still working with because i want to make sure that they're so you're taking in assistant photographers and then yes building mentoring them, up them how you were mm -hmm. yeah. mentoring them letting them second shoot for me um some of my there's a few associates though that they have their own really successful businesses they just kind of fill in the gaps working with me um because we're friends we just like help each other yeah and that's the beauty of the Philly, New Jersey wedding photography community is we just support each other and help each other. And I have people that reach out to me and say, like, I would love if you ever want an associate or need an associate or if you need any help. And I'm like, sure. Yeah, I would love that. I would love for you. And one of my Kirsten, one of my photographer, one of my my she's a second shooter and she's an associate. She's so amazing. And she came to me as an intern and she, uh, she's going to school for photography at Temple and she's been so amazing. 
She's like, I swear, I tell her all the time, you fell from heaven. Like she is, she helps me with so much. I could not do what I do without her. And like, I believe, and from that experience too, I really believe in empowering people because the more people you empower and help, it's like karma. It, yeah, it, it always comes back. You got to help other people. That's what God put us on this earth to do. The more that you give and outpour yourself, it's like a stream. It just it just comes right back. If you're stagnant, if you're a pond, if you're just like a little pond and you're just me and I'm not going to help anybody and I'm scared of my competition and I'm not going to give you my secret and I'm going to protect what's mine, you just become stale. There's no movement. But when you are open and share and you're not afraid and you're an open book and you're, I'll help you. What do you need? I'll help you. You want that? How, you need to know how to do that? I don't mind. I'll tell you anything. That's an open stream now. Now you help that person in it. The universe, God, he makes it come right back to you. Yeah, you know? it's, it's crazy you bring that up because it's kind of how all of this organically started because, you know, I didn't know. That's what, so cool. Like when we started the podcast, it's like, we didn't really ever talk about money. And then it was just like, all right, well, how do we get numbers up? And what's the format going to be? And mm -hmm. over the years, people have, you know, gone and came. It's just, you know, there's really just down to myself and Jesse at this point. And it's like, when I started bringing in the businesses as a format where I'm like, all right, I'll just bring in like my friend who's a tattoo shop or I'll bring in this person who's an artist. And then you start talking to those people before and after and then... I just started always being this version of me that comes from my mom where you just overly help people. Yeah. And you overly do that. And then the more I started doing that and seeing where people were getting comfortable from that, I started getting the most back from that. And mm -hmm. then even recently with like, you know, it's tough because it's like when I started, there wasn't a lot of people doing this. Now you have people who just start doing it and then they just start mm -hmm. like trying to charge ridiculous amounts of money to people for like sponsoring and whatnot. And then like, if you have somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, like how you guys had that meeting, it starts messing everything up because mm -hmm. then people don't want to work with you because somebody else left the bad taste in their mouth. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, I just recently started, and I've always done this, but you know, a lot of people give me business advice, or like do this, get this monetary thing out of it. And I'm just, now I'm just rolling with, this is what I'm going to do. And then when I meet with clients, I'm totally up front where the money goes, what I can do. Mm -hmm. And then I, what I can do for you is this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. And I don't care that you're only paying this and this is, I'm doing all this work. I just want to help you. And then the more people I help, whether they come on here to advertise or whether they come on here to network or whether they come on here for anything, mm -hmm. if I give a moment of a little bit of helping, it goes way further down than, a, than if I'm taking a monetary or if if I try and get something out of it, right. it that's when things stop working out. And that's... then that's how the entire show was built because like, I like doing this, but I've never been someone who stands out. I mean, I've always... It's funny that I'm shy. So like for me, <laughs> you're not shy. <laughs> I am. I, I'm. I can talk to people more because I sit and do this for a couple hours a day. Yeah. You know, but like, I am shy, and like putting myself out there and the things that I do has been difficult. So yeah. like, the more I give out, the more comfortable it is. The more yeah. people want to work. There's no bullshit. Right. There's just hey. Let's just help each other, and yeah. then if something comes out of it, cool. And right. yes, there's a business to run, and I will always do that. But at the same time, it's not that much work to just try and help people. And it gives you energy and life. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And I, I feel like it's the what we were designed to do. I'm a spiritual person. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I really believe that God made us to be givers, to be generous because, and to have an abundant mindset. And like, if you're stingy and greedy, that's not an abundant mindset. You're afraid. You're operating out of fear, not love. And if you're operating out of love, love gives. Love doesn't take. It always gives. And it multiplies because a, if you help somebody, they'll never forget that. Yeah. They'll never Where's forget that. Where does your spir spirituality come from? Because you're not afraid to put it out there, you post about it, um, yeah. which good for you. I Thank have friends you. that are like that, and one of the most remarkable things about that is that they don't care that that's how they want to be. Um, so I see that you're you're there, and I'm always interested. But like, where did spirituality or that start being a part of your life? 
Well, I have such a big void in my life from not having a mom, from not knowing my mother and growing up with a feeling of abandonment and not knowing it was abandoned, like a fear of abandonment, not knowing that that's what it was or rejection, but just feeling this void that nothing, it's like an itch, nothing can scratch. And it wasn't, it was like right out of um, high school is when I I went, I was going through this like deep, dark loneliness and depression. Um, And I was always kind of in coffee shops and bookstores and looking up books. And I found myself one day in the spiritual book section. I think it was at Barnes and Noble. I don't know. And I found a book. um, It was called Changed in His Presence. It was by a guy named Sam Hen, who I don't even follow anymore or anything. But that book talk about um like worship and and I didn't even know what worship was I was like what is this and about God's presence and that when you worship him or and it started talking about the bible so I started reading the bible and learning about worship and God's presence like wait you can feel God's presence I'm like what and for me I would feel God's presence in nature or like at the ocean or when you get real quiet or you meditate you get still peace comes over you well, at the end of the book, there was a prayer that was basically like, God, have mercy on me. Like, I know I'm a sinner, or whatever, and that Jesus died on the cross for you. And I just am alone in my bedroom, like read the prayer, didn't even really know what I was doing. I was just like, and I really felt something. I just was like, all of a sudden something came over me and I was just weeping. I felt the presence of God. And that was like such a change, a life-changing moment. And then I found a church. It was Church on the Move at the time, which is now Life Church. They have campuses all over the Lehigh Valley, Allentown, East, and Pastor Randy. And I went to that church and I became a Christian there, was a part of like the young adult ministry and everything. And I don't know, I just connected with God. And God's love for me was the only love that could fill the void. Yeah, His love, when I saw, and I don't mean to make this a whole thing. I'm not trying to convert anybody. No, 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 no. I'm just sharing. And I didn't didn't ask for that. I just know this is a part of your life. It's a part of my story, yeah. Why not go down that road because it's something that's meaningful to you. Exactly. And so for me, it was like, there's no man's love, like man- no mother, father, child, person, boyfriend, husband, nobody's going to fill your heart and fill that void. Only God's love can. And through what Christ did on the cross, that he died for us when we were sinners. And that revelation and watching the passion of the Christ or watching the, you know, just when you think about what he did and what he endured for us. And most people you know, just think it's a nice story, whatever, or not most people, but some people, yeah, yeah, yeah. some people might think it's just a nice story. Um, but I'm not Catholic. I'm not, I don't call myself anything. I just know historically he was here. Um, I know they have the Shroud of Turin. Like they have a lot of documentation. Like I would love to go to Israel. I'd love to go to Jerusalem and like see all of it. Um, but that is my spirituality is just Jesus. Like yeah. just him as a person and who he represents and like what he represents, the ultimate love and sacrifice and giving. And it has changed me. And I still have moments of weakness. I mean, God, I'm still, we're all a work in progress. I'm not perfect. Definitely no one is. And it's at those moments where his love shines even greater when when I'm a shithead, <laughs> so you know, like he loves he loves us so much that nothing can deter that love, and it's it fills in my heart, it fills the gaps in my heart so much so that I can then love other people, yeah, and be unselfish. Yeah, my mom uh, and I told you when we talked on the phone. Um, I was raised Catholic. My mom was super church church yeah. stress us up church yeah. like, like the last time i went to church and i don't go to church much um i should just go with my mom because it's her spot and i never understood you know religion I, it was always something that i pushed away because um you know i was an out of control kid that was forced to go to uh, catholic school so <clears throat> when i went to church with my mom one day and i watched what it was doing for my mom and I, I and i bring this story up to people who argue religion about me i'm like regardless of what you believe or not there's people that 
uh, thoroughly enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And my mother is one of those people. And take all of the belief out and anything you want to say about any of it. Yeah. What my mom does is she goes to church and she has a reset with herself talking and g going through the sermon and all that. And when I started realizing that that's how she raised four kids, dealt with my dad's heart attack, did all this crazy stuff that went on in our lives that most people don't know about, and all the crazy things that happened to my brother and every, my brothers and kids and everything else is she always went back there. And if that got her through that, I don't really knock anybody for uh, yeah. doing anything like that. But I, I saw that and I wasn't going to not touch on it because I know it's important to you. And I don't like when people, um, it's hard. It's not that I don't like when people, it's, it's hard when you get stereotyped, you know, like I don't want to be, I don't ever want to turn somebody away because of whatever but if i do you know I, it's hard because it's such a personal thing like you're never supposed to talk about religion or politics right but for me it's not religion yeah. you know it's really not it's it's a for me it's the way like you said it, you helped your your mother for me my spirituality my faith my creator, he created me to do what I'm doing. And so I gather the most strength and love from him. I couldn't show up to people's weddings and give a spirit of love and, and the energy I bring. So many times I hear from moms especially, and it's ironic that it's moms who really like me, but they'll be like, wow, your energy. I just, the energy that you're coming, I, we, I love your energy. And it's God, it's, it's my, before on my way to that wedding, I was praying. God, give me the love and the strength today to come and give a give them a good experience and to love on them with your love. And without love, you have nothing, like I don't think. And so God's love empowers me, gives me the strength to do what I do. And I feel like he gave, he's the ultimate creator, right? Like he is the ultimate creator. Look at a flower, look at the sunset. The other day I was driving home from the beach with my boyfriend and we were like, look at that sun. Look at the sunset. Look at the sky. How could anyone look at that and not see God? Like, how can you just drive by that and just think, oh, that's just the sun. Like, yeah. It's like a masterpiece. It's like a master painting. Like the sky looks like crazy right now. And there's such beauty. Like, where did that beauty come from? You know? Yeah. Or like crazy flowers, like exotic flowers or exotic birds or butterflies or the craziest beautiful things in life. It's like, wow, God's really creative. Or certain animals or certain dogs that you see, you're just like, God has a sense of humor, you know? And it's like, that's where, cre in my mind, I sometimes pray, okay, creator God. Whoever created me, that's how I started praying actually, was whoever created me like come forth. Like I wanna know who made me and why. Why am I here? What did you do? Why did you make me? And who better to go to than your creator? And if you just pray that, he shows up. He, he shows you. Not like I don't heard an audible voice, but things start, oh, doors open, a window here, something happens, you meet a person, you find a book. Yeah. You a know? lot of people usually go through that after the passing of someone. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, that's, I mean, I've lost so many friends where you just, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of times where I'm just like, all right, cool. Like that's from this, that's from that. And then it's just kind of moments you hang on to. And then it's just, yeah. you know, like you get to say hello to a friend. Are you conscious of the fact that you completely manifested and took everything that you love and put it into one thing and you get to do it for a living? I think, I guess I said, you're right. I guess that's what happened. Yeah, it yeah. really has. Yeah. I mean, if you go back the entire story, it's just like, you know, it's just like the fact that you even said that like, mom so it's like you know but you're a mom mm -hmm. and then it's like you're being the ma the version of the mother that you probably wish you had and then yeah. it's just like and then you took that hurt and then turned it into complete positive things and you got into a lane and then made it your own and then you just kept fighting after filling and i think it's important to have that void and it drives a lot of people mm -hmm. and you don't know how or when that's going to be filled but when it does you feel whole and yeah. if you do, if you if, if you don't have a void you obviously don't know what i'm talking about but they're created through either things that are out of your control or something that happened to you but um if you don't stop looking it, like if, if you obsess about it you can literally make yourself and rebuild yourself and completely remake yourself into a version of whole by filling yourself with things that you love and you've done that. 
It's got to feel crazy. And like we were saying before about, so you set your goal, you set your intention, and then you decide, okay, what kind of person achieves that goal? So if I want to be a celebrity wedding photographer, what does a celebrity wedding photographer do on their off time? What do they look like? How do they dress? What kind of equipment do they use? Who do they hang with? Where do they eat? What do they do? Like you almost brand yourself. Yeah. You have to start branding yourself in that direction. And it all starts in your mind. And I have these affirmations that I have in a plastic sleeve and I have it by my bedside. I'm such a dork. But, and I don't look at it every day because like, you know, like sometimes you, you forget, but I look at it enough and some of the goals, some of the affirmations I have met, some of them are still kind of scary, but every day I say it or I look at it and you have to keep the vision in front of you and scare yourself because you're here so short. I believe that we're here for such a short time. And you go through so many battles in life. Life's not kind sometimes. It's a very harsh, the elements of this world are harsh sometimes, you know? I mean, COVID. There are things that make us warrior. Like, you have to be a freaking warrior. And, and once you become that warrior, peaceful, loving warrior, but you have to fight. And part of that is in the mind, right? And setting the intention, setting the goal, thinking, envisioning yourself there. And then you manifest it, I think. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of work. Um, it's why I enjoy pre bringing people on like yourself. And I knew this story. You had posted something about, it was a memory of when you moved. Yeah. And I was just like, ah, there's a really good story here. And we had already had talked about doing it because I was generally interested in photography and how you get to a level that you're on. It's not normal photography. It's not, you know, it's, you know, you've been published in magazines and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it's, it's, it's not your everyday thing. So I was intrigued by that, but Thank then your you. post uh, and everybody has a story. It's just whether everybody. or not people want to go it. back and share it. Or, you know, a lot of times people just brush over it and I got to stop and do it. But like everybody has a path and a journey that they had on. And it's, 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 it's remarkable what you've done and how you've gotten to the place where you're going. Thank you. Um, I want to wrap up because you do have a drive home. Okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't want you it's to have so to It's so fun. It's so fun to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, Anytime you yeah. ever want to come up, anytime you're promoting anything, um, you know, and especially with the new studio, there's other different projects that we can get into. Definitely. Um, but I just want to thank you for driving up here. You yes. had a very unique story. There was a lot of things that you opened up about, and I appreciate that. Um, and I, you too. It's good to hear your story. Yeah, I mean, I do it so then, you know, I can't ask you something personal without being And then being not personal. share your so personal. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I've learned a lot. And the one thing is you have to make the guest comfortable. And the, the only way you can make somebody comfortable is if you share the amount that they're sharing. Yep. So. I feel like we have a similar... We have a similar spirit, like of giving and and having good energy and bringing inspiration and hope. I hope that I, I inspired somebody or gave somebody hope. I get messages. It's cool. Um, they come out of the blue, and then you know sometimes I forget the you know what the shows the. I've been doing it for so long and the idea of the show didn't really start coming together like this version of the show. There's always been 20 different versions. There's ones where we drink. There's ones where we just hang out. Yeah. There's ones about hot dogs. So <laughs> like uh, this show, I you know, like I said, it was always an itch. Yeah. But like I needed to do it alone because you can't make people do things that you can't explain. Right. So like when I started doing it solo, the show started changing. But I've had people hit me up and been like, hey, man, like that was a really great interview. I was having a bad day. And then when I get those, that's when I'm just like, ah, like you forget Mm -hmm. You have to turn it into a business, yep. you know, so it's like you're on this journey and I always move the finish line. So mm -hmm. like what you said, I'll never stop working. I'll change probably to do something else like, you know, how you're getting into that where, you, you know, I got to be smart about it. We're like, hey, cool. Like get into real estate or yeah. like get into investment yeah, properties, totally. you know, things yep. that'll like, you know, or Absolutely. Like, like opening up the bagel shop. Yep. Like that was a step towards Yep. solidifying having something real you know I built this from nothing and it works off of nothing mm -hmm. and it's really hard to make it go but if I open a business that's a business and I make a unique spin on it I can have something special and then I was like cool I can do more of that now because I, I know that. how to do it so it's like you know but and you're leaving something in the world yeah you really yeah. are you really are you're helping people 
it's cool. Mm, yeah. Like I said, it's, it's fulfilling. It, it, it happens every once in a while. And or somebody even, will make a comment yeah. in YouTube and it's not like terrible stuff or like one of my friends just like making fun of me. Um, you know, sometimes <laughs> there's like, it, it comes out through and then it's like, all right, between life, my friends dying, reality, t-shirts, clothing, all this stuff going on where it's just this whirlwind and then you get that and it's like, oh yeah, that was the point of the show. <laughs> like it wasn't about any of this other dumb shit that you're trying to do uh, to advance in life but like the general purpose that never changes of what goes on here and I think that's really cool I want to give you a chance to plug anything you're doing it is a good Instagram follow I'm not just saying that um, I even messaged her <laughs> the one time about she she does some cool stuff and she knows what she's doing with photography so I want to give you a chance to kind of plug anything you're doing if anyone's listening I'm sure the female listeners are going to go up on this episode <laughs> so uh, if any anyone's interested in contacting you uh how they can get a hold of you yeah so my website's denise marie dot photography and then my instagram is denise marie underscore photography um yeah denise marie photography cool That's me i will put all of that in the below section of the audio and the video if you're a first time listener first time watcher it's never again studio.com that has the video the audio it has the clothing everything i do is on there if you want to stay on there and you want to look at everything there you can if not subscribe to the youtube spotify is where this is all going to go because once i can upload videos over there primarily that's going to be but if you search never again studio that has everything uh you will find about me uh thank you so much for coming on and I hope you do not get stuck in traffic thank <laughs> you of course I believe it. Never again radio. Get into it, brother.